I'm going to set out some rules, and then I'll introduce the discussants, and then I'll give a very, very short uh, framing introduction. So um, it's important in the first session to establish expectations of one another, and Fauna and I, Fauna Foreman Bartzlai and I, will alternate, alternate moderation of the first six sessions, and Peter Cowie, Dean of the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, will moderate the seventh. And although I have many critical interests in the content of the sessions I moderate, for the most part, I will stick to my moderator role for the sake of role clarity and efficiency. It doesn't mean that I'm brain dead. Um, each of the participants will speak for uh, 12 to 15 minutes, and in order to most fairly distribute time, we ask that everyone respect that limit, and I may quietly remind panelists of time remaining to speak. Okay. And then uh, the moderator will call on um, Amartya Sen uh, if he has, if he wishes to say anything. Audience members, the participants, discussants for questions and comments. And occasionally the moderator may ask for the discussion to move on so that more people will have a fair chance to participate. Although there are a small number of people here, so um, I don't expect there'll be uh, too much harsh discipline. And um, our panelists today, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to introduce panelists only by their names and positions. Um, and all are distinguished by many academic accomplishments and recognitions, would, which would take about 20 minutes to go through. And there are links to, the, links to their biographies or at the conference webpage. So they are Richard Arneson, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at University of California, San Diego. Anthony Layden, um, Professor of Philosophy, University of Illinois, Chicago. Daryl Mollendorf, Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Institute for Ethics and Public Affairs at San Diego State University. David Brink, Professor of Philosophy at University of California, San Diego. Uh, and Director of the Institute for Law and Philosophy at uh, the University of San Diego School of Law. And Fried Abdel Nur, Professor of Political Science and Middle East Studies, and faculty coordinator of the Center of Islamic and Arabic Studies at San Diego State University. We are, uh, this event is being filmed for UCSD TV, or UC TV, and thus um, we'll be passing, uh, I'll be passing this to each of the speakers and to audience members who ask questions. It's not too scary. I'll, uh, um, so a brief introduction. Uh, this, this may be the panel most difficult for outsiders to follow. Uh, the, ma <laughs> the material is not intrinsically difficult, but it may, it's like walking into the middle of a conversation without knowing what was said during the first half. So. Um, don't think we're putting on airs, it's just that we're in the middle of this conversation. Uh, political uh, philosophy was dead in the 20th century until revived by John Rawls in his Theory of Justice, published in 1971, and in some uh, major later works. He was undoubtedly the leading political philosopher of the 20th century. Amartya Sen uh, pays warm tribute to Rawls as a thinker, a colleague, and a friend. Uh, Rawls uh, Sen and Kenneth Arrow, the founder of social choice theory, co-taught a class at Harvard on political philosophy in 1968 and 1969 based on Rawls' then forthcoming theory of justice. And Sen, Sen and Rawls were at Harvard together for decades. Sen's idea of justice uh, departs from Rawls, and it departs in two senses. Uh, first, in working in the tradition of political philosophy that Rawls revived, and second, in defining itself initi initially as corrections of perceived weaknesses in Rawls' scheme. Uh, Rawls' theory of justice was both, or is, both wonderfully innovative and a remarkable synthesis of themes in the history of political and moral thought. So, philosophy guys, if I don't get it quite right, you can straighten me out. <laughs> to sharpen, I'm going to give a 30-second summary of Rawls. Uh, 
to sharpen our understanding about what basic institutions, free and equal citizens seeking fair cooperation would agree to, Rawls proposed a thought experiment. Imagine you go behind what he called a veil of ignorance to what he called an original position, where you would know most of what people know about our society, but you wouldn't know which person you would be in that society. You wouldn't know your class, race, religion, gender, talent, <coughs> personal characteristics, and the like. And Rawls says that behind, this is in order to uh, make uh, the requirements of impartiality vivid to the imagination. Rawls says that from behind that veil of ignorance, all would agree, uh, roughly speaking, on equal liberties as the first priority. And second, all would agree, um, um, here comes some jargon that I'm going to explain. All would agree that social and economic inequalities should be arranged so as to be, A, of the greatest benefit to the worst off in society. And this is intended to allow for differential incentives that would increase social resources and make the poor better off than they would be in purely uh, mechanically egalitarian circumstances. And um, it, B, behind that veil of ignorance, all would agree uh, that social and economic equal inequalities should be arranged so that um, positions should uh, be open to all under conditions of fair equal opportunity. And this, among other things, uh, forbids uh, caste society. And I think it's uh, uh, in the American uh, in the American sitting, setting is an implicit uh, criticism, for example, of Jim Crow. And Rawls, uh, Rawls's approach and ones like it seem to work well when applied to a single modern liberal democratic regime in isolation. And um, conceptual and practical problems arise when one attempts to, ex to extend it to all of global humanity. Now, <clears throat> Sen's departures from Rawls are listed at page 90 of the idea of justice. And to summarize, I'm going to quote from page four, 410, and I'm coming to a close. This is the last thing I'm going to say. There is a strong case, quote, there is a strong case for replacing what I've been calling transcendental institutionalism that underlies most of the mainstream approaches to justice in contemporary f political philosophy, including John Rawls' theory of justice as fairness by focusing on questions of justice first on assessments of social realizations, that is, on what actually happens, and secondly, on comparative issues of enhancement of justice rather than trying to identify perfectly just arrangements. So with that, uh, Rich Richard Arneson. So thank you, and thanks to uh, everybody who made this possible, including mostly uh, Sen by his writings, or especially Sen by his writings. So, so I, I'm just going to uh, assume you've got the idea of the transcendental and the comparative from the talk last night. Uh, the transcendental looks for, lo is looking for the, to identify the ideally best, and the comparative is we're, we're looking for a theory that uh, gives us uh, comparisons between alternatives and picks out one is better or worse, one or the other is better or worse. Uh, it's a matter of indifference. So, so um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm prepared to be illuminated by Sen, but I just don't find. I mean, I, I see the contrast, but I just don't see it as very helpful. I mean, Sen says, for instance, that the social contract tradition is is you know, you know institutional and transcendental. But I mean, uh, well, take Nozick for instance. Uh, no, I mean, Nozick is somebody who says. There are rights that people have. There are natural moral rights, independent of social conventions, and we should just respect people's rights. You may not like it, but I mean, does he have no interest in comparative questions? Sen says somewhere, this is from the book, uh, he cites Nozick as an example of the transcendental theorist who asserts the folly of going to the comparative sidetrack. This is Sen. Nozick, this is Sen now, quote, is content to demand that all libertarian rights be fulfilled. This is his transcendental picture, but dismisses the issue of trade-offs between failures and the fulfillment of different types of rights. He has very little use for what he calls the utilitarianism of rights. So that's Sen. There's a mistake here. I mean, look, there's two different issues that are being run together. One, you might be somebody who says, people have rights, and you should never violate people's rights. They're exceptionalists. But even if you think that, 
I mean, rights vary in their stringency or, you know, or uh, their, their moral weight. I mean, I, you know, you have a right not to be tortured or murdered. I have a right to my extra shirt button. It's my property. But sure, I mean, for instance, for a theory of punishment, we'll need to assess uh, how, you know, not just did you violate rights, but how bad is your rights assessment. Moreover, even if we say rights should never be violated, there will be situations where there's nothing else I can do. If I take a step with my left foot, I violate someone's rights. If I take a step with my right foot, I you know, fail to tell the truth, which I promise to do. If I sit still and do nothing, I still violate somebody's rights, given, given a prior promise or something. So in that case, we, you know, it just built into the approach. We need comparisons. And uh, Nozick hasn't given much attention to that himself, but people in the tradition, Judith Thompson and others, have. So I mean, I, I mean, I mean maybe there's somebody, a theorist of justice somewhere, who doesn't care about comparisons, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't see it. Um, institutionalism. I mean, in, in the John Locke, Robert Nozick picture, you know, prior to institutions, you know, the, you know, w you know, it doesn't matter what the institutions are. If there's slavery, it doesn't matter. If there's democracy, it doesn't matter. If the majority says X, it doesn't matter. People have rights which, can, which must be respected come what may. That's pre-institutional. It tells us what to do. And it gives us lots and lots of comparisons. I mean, if, if I mean, I, given, given, a, given the natural rights that people have, then given a comparison of a bunch of alternatives, I should eliminate the ones that violate rights, and of the rest, I'm free to do whatever I choose. You may not like the theory, but it's not that it doesn't give us comparisons. Uh, now there's something, so this is just, these are, we call these just re requests for clarification. Um, uh, David Brink, if, if, yeah, we'll say some things about this maybe. Uh, but, so, so, but it is true, I mean, it, another of these contrasts that, that, that Sen is talking about is institution-focused versus realization-focused. And it is true about the Nozick approach and the libertarian approach and the natural, the locking natural rights tradition generally, that it's indifferent. You know, so it's indifferent to the actual consequences for people's lives. So long as you respect rights, that, that's the end of the story. What, what happens to people be, doesn't matter beyond that you didn't violate their rights. Sen criticizes this, and I'm entirely on board with him in this. And this criticism, we have to look to the consequence of proposed principles or norms for regulating society. You got to look at the consequences for people's lives. That's a criticism that I think cuts very wide and cuts very deep. It also cuts against John Rawls, I think. So I'm just going to say, do I have any time left? I, I, lost, my, <laughs> I lost my watch. Sorry. Well, you, uh, have, you have okay. 11 minutes. All right. OK, OK. So, so, it, so, so Rawls, so, so, so here, here's, here's a a, a one second, 15 second summary of Sen versus Rawls. It's beautiful, I think, because, I mean, in philosophy we argue forever, we never come to any conclusions. But Sen's criticism of Rawls, theory of justice, is as close as we come in philosophy to a knockout, knockdown refutation, a decisive refutation. So, so let me just, just, just describe the achievement just a little bit. So Rawls, a central component of Rawls' view is, look, in a theory of justice we have to compare people's condition. I mean, we're concerned, for instance, for the condition of the worse off. Well, who's worse off? We need some, some way of calibrating that. So Rawls' proposal is, in a modern society, there are many conceptions of the good. People worship many gods. So let's say that the metric for comparison, the, the standard for evaluating people's condition for purposes of theory of justice is primary social goods, things that any rational person will want, whatever else she wants. Those things, the kind of the common set, that, that, uh, that any, things that anybody will want, uh, uh, these things uh, that can be distributed by society, they should be distributed in a fair way, and then Rawls principles will tell us what that is. And sends, so th that's the primary social goods idea, which just, on the face of it, I think has a certain attraction. But Sen has a, a, a very simple and very powerful criticism. It's probably not as simple as I'm going to make it out. So this is, this is the cartoon version. Uh, look, uh, just suppose for simplicity that fairness equals equality. But, I mean, people, people vary in their traits, in their personal traits, in their circumstances. And surely what we should be concerned about is not just the pile of resources, the stuff that people have, but what they're enabled to be and do by means of those resources. So, for example, you know, suppose there's a two-person society. One person is legless and one person has functioning legs. And then we give them an equal pile of Rawlsian resources, primary social goods. This is, there's no equality here. In, the, in any sense that matters, the legless person will have to spend most of her income, let's say, on uh, mobility devices or prosthetics or crutches or something, whereas the person with legs will, will you know, be able to do all kinds of things with the resources. So, I mean, it, 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 there seems to be something fundamentally wrong with it. So, uh, Sen's 
suggestion is we should be focused on if you, if you like, something like real freedom, uh, capability, that is what you are enabled to be and do with the resources that you have given your personal traits, given your circumstances, right? Uh, so in the example of the person with the legless person and the person with functioning legs, we take into account the functioning legs when we decide what, what sort of fair arrangement. Imagine we were just distributing. Imagine a simple, there's no production. Simple, there's no production in the economy. Just imagine the simplest economy where we've got some stuff, manna or something, and we're just dividing it out. In that simplest world, we still need to take, of individual, take account of individual differences. And so the capability approach will give us a different. So the question is, we need, uh, we need to be equalizing or you know, whatever, whatever your fairness principle is, you know, getting a fair distribution of not primary goods, but capabilities. This, it's, in the, it's, in, it's a view in the, in the family of real freedom. You know, what am I not just formally free to do, the laws don't forbid it, but what am I actually enabled to do, given my resources, given my circumstances? Uh, okay, so, so objection is that, uh, I mean, there are various uh, roles and replies, but I, I think they fall flat. So, but, but an objection here that, that is serious, I think, is that there are just too many capabilities. I mean, there, there's infinite you know, uh, uh, numbers along many dimensions. A person, I mean, if I have no arm, I mean, I have the, com the capability to scratch my, the plus spot where my hand isn't, you know, in, a million, in an infinite number of different ways. And you don't if you've got an arm, right? So, so, so the, the, the comparisons, it looks as though there are just too many capabilities. The set is too huge, many trivial. And in terms of comparisons, it looks as though th there won't be any, you know, nobody's capability set will dominate anybody else's. And so it looks as though we're, we're not going to get... We're not going to, you know, it, it'll always turn out that everybody's got, you, 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 can't, you can't compare one person's capability set to another. So a, a suggestion, a friendly suggestion, uh, many, several people made this, but it was one of, the people, one of the prominent people was Martha Nussbaum years ago, said, look, in order to work out the Sen view and nail down the criticism of against Rawls, we're going to have to uh, pick out the important capabilities, the ones that matter from the ones that don't. And Marth, Nussbaum, Professor Nussbaum's suggestion was, we, we need to, you know, it's the capabilities that will enable you to do and be, you know, it's stuff that's genuinely good. It's, it's, it's a matter of getting an, sort of an objectively good right here. I mean, it's, it's welfare, but we have to be careful. We have to think about what's the best way to think about welfare or well-being. A well-being approach looks terrible if we've got a sort of crude theory of well-being. If we said nothing matters to well-being except pleasure and pain, that's just wrong. There's other stuff that people legitimately care about. If we said it's just desire satisfaction, that sounds wrong because my desires don't reliably track my good. My desire was to stay in bed this morning. So, uh, so, so, uh, so I'm, I'm, people will recognize I'm, I'm trotting roughly over very delicate ground here. Um, so, so, we, so, so, the, so the suggestion is, now this is, this is a, so the, the Sen Nussbaum view is that we should marry the capabilities approach to uh, an objective list. I mean, the, the what question is, what the, 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 the roughly the fair distribution is, uh, uh, what, that, that what are you enabled to be and do that's of value? What, 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 do, what, can, what can you do that's, that, that adds value to your life or, you know, or to the life of others? So we're going to marry the capability of approach to an objective list notion of what's good for people. Uh, this, this, it's a little bit anachronistic to describe this as the Sen Nussbaum approach. Sen was never really tempted by this. <laughs> he, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to go this way. And Nussbaum sort of went for it for a while years ago and then kind of retreated from it. But I, but I think, even, you know, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good idea. It's a fort that may be still worth defending, even if the people who built it have moved on. Right? So, so, so I like the idea. However. Uh, and I think there's more to be said here. I mean, you might say, well, look, this, is, this violates, if you tried to carry this out, this would violate neutrality on the good. The liberal state is supposed to be neutral between different people's conceptions of the good and controversial conceptions of the good. And the Sen Nussbaum view that I'm describing is going to be flagrantly violating that. But that's just question begging. I mean, yes, this, the, the view is non neutral. That's the point, right? That, that's, you know, and, and, and uh, I mean, very broadly, you might say, look, I'm a rational agent. My views about my good. My views about what's good for other people should be considered. But as a rational agent, it, it doesn't violate my dignity. If you coerce me in the name of things that qua rational I would accept if I were thinking clearly and not making mistakes. Right. Uh, so um, uh, however, um, 
it's, it's a nice approach. I, I think there's a worry, though. Uh, I, th I mean, roughly the worry is, uh, in Sen's language, capabilities versus functionings. I mean, the, the, the objection of Sen to the capabilities, of, to the Rawlsian primary goods approach, is that it's sort of fetishistic. We're focusing the theory of justice and telling the theory of justice to care about, you know, and to be basing the, d deciding the proper distribution and the proper decision and the proper rules for society and for individual conduct based on a standard, uh, a measure of people's condition that isn't really right, isn't really what we ought to care about when we think about it. That's the fetishism ex objection. And the problem is the same objection, it seems to me, can be laid at the capabilities approach door. And a simple, the simplest way to see this is if capabilities, if justice was about the fair distribution of capabilities and nothing, that's what's ultimately what we care about, then we should think about situations in which the fair distribution of capabilities so described is going to come way apart from any kind of distribution that actually leads to capabilities being used and exercised in ways that enhance people's lives and make for better lives for people, fairly distributed. So for instance, suppose that Tom is wealthy and very well off, and Sally is poor and badly off. And so there's a reason for Tom to transfer resources to poor on a capabilities approach with, you know, with, you know, in order to, let's just say, to, to equalize the, the uh, distribution of capabilities. So you know, we, we can, Tom can transfer resources to Sally, improve her capabilities. However, uh, however, I mean, this, this will still be true. It'll be just as true if we know in advance with certainty that Sally will not use the capabilities in any sensible way. Uh, she'll waste them, they'll, they'll get destroyed, the capabilities come in the form of eggs, and uh, Sally is just going to be clumsy. You know, she could carry the eggs carefully but, and make omelets, but she's going to break the eggs. We just know that with certainty. Uh, or, uh, or she may have religious b beliefs. That, you know, we put these resources on the, sh on the shore, but she has religious beliefs against taking goods that, are there, that sh wash up on the shore or something, right? For the capabilities approach, the capabilities are still there. They're just as good. So the obligation on Tom to provide the capabilities should still hold. But my sense is whatever obligation we have to help the needy in that situation just disappears, right? I mean, if we absolutely, I mean, if you, give, so you raise Arneson's salary. So I have more, you know, more real freedom, more capability. There's, there's more, more things I could do. However, if you know for certainty that all that's going to happen is that raising Arneson's salary will enable him to give him the, his budget set expands, and he then will, in fact, purchase cocaine and live worse, uh, that, if you absolutely know that, then that takes away the obligation to help in that way. Right? So, so, it's, 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 so capabilities aren't what we really care about. They're of supreme importance. I mean, I mean, it's actually part of the good in many ways, uh, being forced to do, the f being freely choosing, for being forced to do physics problem problems at gunpoint and doing them well is different and doesn't enhance your life as well as having the free choice and freely choosing to do physics and doing the physics well. That, that, that's, that's better. So freedom can be a component of the good and also it's just a, a, me a supremely important means, right? You, you want the freedom to choose what you want at the restaurant because you don't know what you want in advance, and so, you know, so freedom, freedom will help you out. However, there, it's supremely important, but as a means, it's not what we really care about. What we really care about is not capabilities, but functionings, or just good lives for people, good lives for people in well-being, good lives for people fairly distributed, or, or so I say. Thanks. I uh, don't think I can speak as fast as... Dick Arneson, so I, I will uh, try and say less so as not to take up too much time. Um, I think, I'm not sure of this, and unfortunately Amarch is not here to verify it, but I think I may be the only student of Amarch's who has a PhD in philosophy and not in any of the other fields he, has, he teaches in. Uh, and so I sort of think of this uh, intervention as an attempt to invite uh, Sen to get in touch with his inner philosopher. Um, so he will unfortunately miss the invitation and uh, he can stay safely an economist. Um, <laughs> I want to sort of lay out a couple of distinctions. I'm a philosopher, that's what we do. Uh, and my aim here is to try and create what I think is a more useful conceptual frame in which I think Rawls's work on justice and Sen's work on justice can be in a much better fruitful conversation and thus I think also hopefully help the rest of us over the next two days enter in a fruitful conversation about issues of justice and global justice. Um, 
And I think one of the things that's required for that kind of conversation is learning to hear what we think is familiar material as if it's not familiar, learning to really hear what people are saying that's not being uh, said in um, the, the language we're used to. So I want to start, actually, because I agree with Dick and I think with Daryl about the usefulness of some of the central distinctions that Sen makes to set up his view, um, that those aren't very helpful in really getting clear on what the issues are that divide uh, Rawls and Sen and, and allow them to talk to each other. So rather than think in terms of institutional versus uh, realization focused or um, transcendental and comparative, I think the really big difference in theorizing about justice turns on whether or not we think that justice is a state that we bring about or justice is a way of relating to other people. And that's not the distinction between consequentialism and deontology, which is, will be familiar to the philosophers in the room. Um, it's rather a question of whether we think of justice in, as a sort of social engineering problem. And so we think of ourselves as social engineers trying to figure out the right way to organize the world so that it's just. That's the justice is something we bring about view. Um, or whether we think of ourselves as participants in a myriad of practices and interactions through institutions and directly. And the question is, are we being just in those interactions? Are the institutions that we live within allowing us to be just with one another? Um, and I think one of the things about this is uh, most people, I think, read Rawls as uh, giving us a justice, bringing about what it would be to bring about justice. Uh, I mean, I think Richard Arneson. Uh, does that and did that in, in his remarks. Um, I actually think of Rawls as giving us a view of justice as how we relate to one another. And I'm not sure where uh, Sen fits on this distinction between bringing about justice and relating to one another. Uh, I think he also reads Rawls as, bring, as thinking of justice as something to bring about. Um, so I want to try and present this idea of justice as a way of relating to one another and then uh, very briefly just give you a sense of what it looks like, and then say how that changes how we think about uh, what's often called ideal theorizing in philosophy. So what's the point of having ideals if we're thinking about justice? Uh, and I think we get a different view of that once we see that justice is about uh, relating to one another. So what's distinctive about the justly relating to others? Well, Rawls gives an answer to this which uh, almost never gets quoted, uh, but seems to me one of the central insights in his work, which is that Justice involves being able to face each other openly, right? So when we have just relationships to one another, we can you know, look each other in the face and give reasons for what we do and the institutions that allow us to, to live together in a certain way. And when we don't have justice, we can't do that um, because we're relying on uh, principles or institutions or actions that are arbitrary and thus indefensible. Um, if we think of that, question is the question of justice. Do we situate ourselves vis-a-vis -vis one another in ways that we can justify to one another openly and in good faith? That changes how all the various parts of a theory of justice work. Um, it changes what, why we're asking questions about the space of distribution, right? Whether we're talking about capabilities or primary goods may depend on the particular context in which we're trying to justify a particular institution or a particular set of relationships. Um, and it thus changes how we think about the invocation of institutions, right? Why are we bringing up institutions at all? Well, one reason to bring up institutions is because that's part of how I justify my relationship to you is it, it works, it's mediated by some institution, right? And either that makes it intolerable or that makes it justifiable. Um, how we think about openness to criticism and public reasoning. Again, if we're thinking about justice as how we talk to one another, then the openness to criticism is sort of built into the very idea of relating justly with one another. And then finally, and this is the thing I really want to concentrate on in my remarks, uh, what's the place of ideals? How do ideals work if what we're thinking about is how can we relate to one another such that we can face each other openly? And the main contrast I want to bring out is two ways of thinking about ideals. So the first is to think of ideals as goals, and that I think is the way people who think about justice as something to bring about think about ideals. Um, and so I think that's the way that Sen thinks that Rawls thinks about ideals. Uh, and then there's a way of thinking about ideals as constraints. And I think that's the way Rawls actually thinks about ideals. And I suspect it's the way uh, Sen thinks of ideals as well. And so once we understand how to think about ideals as constraints, it turns out that there's a much more interesting uh, conversation to be had uh, between the two of them and maybe amongst all of us. So what's the difference then between thinking of ideals as goals 
and thinking of them as constraints. Well, if we think of them ideals as goals, then they're like perfect blueprints, right? They're these sort of philosopher templates of this is what justice would look like, and now we have to get there. Um, one of the things about having an ideal like that is there's obviously the question of how to get there. And as uh, Sen points out in the book, that's a really hard question, and knowing where we're going doesn't necessarily help us in answering that, right? I have a blueprint for a beautiful house, and I find myself in a field of rubble, right? Well, that's nice, you know, but how do I clear away the rubble? Which rubble do I clear away first? Who do I, where do I get the contractors? And so forth. Um, so one of the things you have to do if you, if you think of ideals as goals is then run them through a kind of filter of feasibility, right? So we have a goal. We like the goal. Everybody says that's a nice goal. And then the question is, what are the feasible paths to get there? And it may turn out that some of the feasible paths uh, go very slowly. Some of them go more fastly, but get, you know, bang into a, a wall uh, uh, sooner and so forth. And so those are the kinds of questions that people who think of ideals as goals then are forced to confront, right? These questions about feasibility. If, however, we think about ideals as constraints, they work very differently. So ideals work as constraints when they work like moral principles. That is, they tell us here and now stuff we shouldn't do. Right? So if I have an ideal of being moral that involves not lying to people, right? that's not that I'm trying to produce a world in which there are no lies. It means that amongst the things I have in front of me that I can do, the ones that involve telling lies are off the table. Right? I'm constrained in my behavior here and now. Uh, by this particular ideal that I'm trying to live up to. Um, what that means is that we actually start from a set of feasible alternatives, right? Here are the things I can do at the moment, and of those, these would be unjust. So they're not on the table anymore if I'm trying to be just, if I'm trying to realize justice. Um, so that's the basic contrast between thinking of ideals as constraints and as goals. And I want to just quickly sort of fill that out by giving three examples where that seems to me to matter in our thinking about justice. So first, think about equality as a component of justice. If equality is a, our goal, and I think this is the way Richard Arneson's uh, presentation imagines it, right, there are these questions. Well, equality of what? To what degree? Do we have to get actually equal, or do we just need to get everybody up to a high enough level? Um, and then can we bring that about? What, can, you know, what are the constraints on what, how we can bring that about? What would be the first steps in making the world more equal and so forth? But if we think of equality as a constraint, then it involves a set of principles like don't treat others as if they were invisible. Don't treat others as if they are subordinate. Don't blindly defer to others as if they are superior. Don't treat people as means or tools. Um, and those are principles that we hold on to in trying to be just, even if by violating those principles we could make the world a world that would have more equal distribution of something we care about. Right? So we don't produce an equality of capabilities or primary goods or resources by um, manipulating people into uh, doing things that they didn't really understand what they were doing, but that would get a better result. Right? That's not a way to bring about justice on this view of justice as, as how we relate to one another. Um, and I should say, I mean, this idea of equality as, as a constraint on our actions need not just be a, a matter of personal morality. Right? This again goes to this issue of how institutions mediate our behavior. If we have equality as one of our ideals, in this sense of a constraint, then that will change how we think of um, which institutions we should accept or not, right? I shouldn't, I can't face you openly if you have no health care and I have health care because we've, we live in a society that's agreed that we're going to distribute health care non-universally and unequally and say, you know, this, I, you know, well, I got a job, so I got health care, sorry for you. Right? I can't say, there's no way I can say that to you openly. Um, so that's a matter of pointing to an institution as unjust, as not permitting us to face each other openly in this equal way. Okay, let me uh, move on to public reason, which is a central issue in both Rawls's work and Sen's work. If we think of public reason as, a, as an ideal goal, then again, we have this idea. Public reason is a set of reasons, right? And we're going to have a theory that's going to tell us what those reasons are. Um, and then from those reasons, we can derive all kinds of really nice uh, institutional setups, right? So you can think of the original position argument in Rawls as working something like that, if you read Rawls this way, which I don't. Um, that is, there's a set of reasons, those are the public reasons. From those, the philosopher does his magic, sets up this whole nice argument, and out pops an institutional plan and blueprint. Um, but if you think of public reason as a set of constraints, as an ideal as constraints, as again, I think both uh, Sen and Rawls do, then what it means is that you don't push agendas that you can't make good to your fellow citizens. 
even if it's, you're clearly convinced that it's the right thing to do, right? So I'm dead on positive that you know, this would make the world a better place. But I don't have any good arguments that I can make to all my fellow citizens in any reasonable way. And so I abjure going down that road because part of my respect for my fellow citizens is I don't pursue policies I can't make good in public reason arguments. Um, and on that view, the original position plays a very different role in our thinking, right? It's not, a, it's not a tool that produces blueprints. It's one way in which we might make vivid to one of our fellow citizens why a particular view of justice, a particular set of institutions would allow us to face each other openly more clearly, right? I can say, look, think about it this way, right? Imagine that you didn't know who you were, right? Wouldn't that make the, the, the differences amongst us less arbitrary? Um, okay, let me uh, just make one final point then before I run out of time, which is if we think of ideals as constraints and not goals, they also play this other really nice feature, um, which is that they turn out to be enabling. That is, the constraints, there are two ways to think about constraints. Right? One is that there are limits. So there are all these things we could do, but then there are these constraints that prevent us from doing certain things, right? And a lot of people think about morality though, that way. You know, I'd really like to do all these things, but I can't because you know, there's somebody going like that to me and, and uh, telling me I can't. But there's another way of thinking about constraints, which is they're constitutive, right? I can't play chess unless I follow the rules of chess, right? Play, the rules of chess don't limit how I move the pieces on the board. They allow me to play chess. So similarly, we can think of the, lim the ideals of justice when we think of them as constraints as enabling us to do something. Namely, they enable us to act justly. They enable us to be just. And in being just in that sense, we also realize that is make real justice. We make the world a more just place by enacting justice, by obeying these constraints, right? So just to uh, wind this up and uh, as I say in the memo, to cite a different argumentative Indian, right? Following this idea of um, acting on justice by uh, living out the, its ideals, realizing the ideals is one way that we can be the change. Right? And that allows us to think about justice in a very different way, which I hope allows us then to not inv get involved in what ultimately are sort of fruitless meta-conversations about how we theorize about justice, and instead allow us to think about, well, what are all the tools that all our disciplinary uh, expertise give us to think about justice? Right? How do these things bring, bring into focus features of injustice and justice that we might learn from? Um, and I hope that that uh, allows both Sen and Rolls to have a more interesting conversation about you know, how social choice theory as well as uh, you know, uh, Kantian and other philosophical views help us think more clearly about certain aspects of justice and then how other disciplinary uh, views and frameworks that we all uh, have, we can bring them to the table and, and learn to hear each other. Thank you. Excellent. This is a heavily redacted version of the memo that itself didn't have a whole lot of unity to it, so I don't know how much unity this is going to have. Um, but apologies in advance to the commentators for the redactions that, um, that I may be leaving out things that you thought I shouldn't be leaving out. Uh, there's three claims I want to make, and maybe that seems crazy given that I have 12 or 15 minutes, but I'll try to devote four or five minutes to each of these claims. The first is that um, I think that the diagnosis of the problem in Rawls's law of peoples in the, in the idea of justice, the diagnosis there in the idea of justice is mistaken. I want to say why I think that's the case. The second is that uh, I think that there, I want to I claim that there's a plausible institutional account of global justice which both condemns existing global inequality and provides a basis for comparative claims about remedies. And the third claim that I want to discuss is that this idea that there's a sharp the idea that there's a sharp contrast between transcendental institutionalism and realization-focused comparisons to the credit of the latter, that is the realization-focused comparisons, and to the discredit of the former, I think that that, that claim is overdrawn, the claim in, 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 uh, in the idea of justice. So I want to say something about that. So first, to the mistaken diagnosis of the law of peoples. Professor Sen's twofold, has a twofold diagnosis of the law of peoples. Um, the first is that as a transcendental account, it's, quote, concentrates its attention on what, uh, what it identifies as perfect justice, close quote. 
And the second is that, quote, as a straightforward implication of taking questions of justice within the framework of transcendental institutionalism, um, the, uh, sorry, a straightforward implication of that is the claim that we need a sovereign state to apply the principles of justice through a choice of a, through a, choice of a perfect set of institutions. Um, I think these, these twin diseases of perfectionism and statism derive, or he claims, I think, that these twin diseases of perfectionism and statism derive from the transcendental institutionalism of the account in the Law of Peoples. I think it's not the case that the Law of Peoples suffers from the disease of perfection, and um, I think its institutionalism doesn't need to be statist, although it turns out to be statist, and I think that that's a problem. So first, about the perfection, about the perfection in Rawls. The law of peoples aims to answer a particular question in the realm of international politics, for what might we hope? Is a realistic utopia possible, one characterized by, quote, peace and justice between liberal and decent peoples, both at home and abroad? The account that forms the answer is not an account of perfect justice, but a response to, quote, the great evils of human history unjust war and oppression, religious persecution and the denial of liberty of conscience, starvation and poverty, not to mention genocide and mass murder, close quote. And it's informed by the conviction that, quote, this is quoting Rawls here, once the gravest forms of political injustice are eliminated by allowing just or at least decent social policies and establishing just or at least decent basic institutions, the great evil will eventually disappear, close quote. So Rawls's counsel to our hopes is meant to have a direct and, and Rawls's counsel to our hopes is meant to have direct practical implications. It establishes the merits of a liberal foreign policy that tolerates the existence of decent non-liberal peoples. Far from being an exercise in disconnected perfect justice, there's an intelligible and pressing practical question that Rawls is addressing in the law of peoples. This of course doesn't mean either that the account which forms his answer is adequate or that his focal questions are the most important ones. And I believe, in fact, that, that neither is the case. Moving next to the, to, the, um, to the claim or the diagnosis that institutionalism entails statism, I'm only going to be able to fully answer that um, or respond to that, um, that idea in, the, uh, in my comments about the second, uh, the second claim. But let me just say, what I think is um, the, the proper diagnosis of the problem in the law of peoples. This is familiar to the philosophers and political theorists in the audience, perhaps less so to others, so just very briefly. Uh, in the law of peoples, the first step is, uh, is ideal theory, and in ideal theory it includes a, an account of the original posi position, and in the, in the original position we uh, are included only only representatives of reasonable political, or sorry, only reasonable representatives of reasonable politically liberal societies. And these representatives of reasonable political liberal societies affirm, as it turns out, eight principles of international justice that include recognition for state sovereignty on the condition that certain urgent human rights are respected. But the human rights in the law of peoples are limited to the rights of life, personal property, freedom from slavery and serfdom. Um, liberty, but not equal liberty of conscience, formal equality, and the security of ethnic groups from persecution. The question that I think that confronts the reader of the Law of Peoples at this particular point in the book is why the parties place only these very limited restrictions, the observance of these most basic and urgent human rights, on their societies in the first part, um, particularly when in the first part the representatives are representatives of liberal societies. Now one kind of answer that might be given stresses that the representatives are representatives of liberal societies. Knowing that they are such representatives, that although they're committed to other values, they might see no reason to oppose additional limitations on themselves. But if that were the case, why would they impose any proto-liberal limitations or constraints on themselves at all, even those, even those limited to meeting the most basic urgent human rights? Alternatively, another kind of answer would be that maybe as good political liberals, the representatives are worried about the two moral powers of persons. But if that were the case, 
why would they limit their constraints on societies to merely respecting the most basic human rights? It seems to me, and this is my diagnosis of the law of people, that there's just no non-question begging defense of this half step that Rawls takes away from full-blown statism in the law of peoples. But that's not because his institutionalism necessarily entails statism. That's because of the way in which he proceeds in his argument. So let me go on next to my, uh, to my second claim. My second claim that I want to discuss is that there's a plausible institutional account of global justice, an account that both condemns existing global inequality and that provides a basis for comparative claims about remedies. Start with some familiar facts, brutal facts about existing global inequality, familiar to most of you here probably. The richest 5% of the world's population earns 114 times the poorest 5%. The total income of the richest 1% is equal to the poorest 57%. But income equality is less severe than wealth inequality. The assets of the richest three people in the world are more than the combined GMP of the least developed countries, of all the least developed countries. 1.3 billion people lack access to clean water. 840 million children are malnourished. Inequal and there's substantial, these have substantial effects on, on longevity. So there's substantial inequalities in longevity. In 2001, the mortality rate for children under five was nearly 26 times higher in, in countries in sub-Saharan Africa than in the OCED countries. Over 60% of deaths in developed countries occur beyond the age of 70 compared to about 30% in developing countries. So we live in a starkly unequal world. And I think Professor Sen is exactly right to direct us to consider, quote, any of the great many changes that can be proposed for reforming the institutional structure of the world today to make it less unfair and less unjust. Here's a recipe, I think, for how to do that on an institutional or from an institutional perspective. Start with the idea of a morally basic pre-institutional um, notion of respect for basic human dignity um, as is expressed in human rights documents, in many human rights documents. From that, make an argument, and I'm not going to make the argument, that this entails justificatory respect and what justific justificatory respect requires is that institutional power must be wielded in a way that people living within the institutions are able to reasonably endorse the rules for the institutional functioning and then give an account of what kinds of institutions are institutions that generate duties of justice and notice that certain kinds of institutions that might generate duties of justice um, are also institutions that produce goods and powers to which nobody has a pre-institutional account. And from that recipe, I think you can derive an account of, a, of the Global Economic Association as one that generates duties of egalitarian distributive justice. Of course, that's all moving very quickly but I submit that it's a plausible institutional account of global egalitarian distributive justice. It would establish an institutionalism that's not necessarily theoretically conservative, that's not necessarily status. There's nothing, I think, in the notion of institutionalism that requires us to, um, uh, that requires it to re reject it on grounds that it's status. Third claim, third and final claim. The sharp contrast between transcendental institutionalism and realization-focused comparisons to the credit of the latter and to the discredit of the former, I think, is simply overdrawn. So start with institutionalism versus realization. Professor Sen seeks an account of justice that provides the basis, quote, for reforming the institutional structure of the world today to make it less unfair and less unjust. And I've, uh, I've already uh, noted that I think that that's a laudable and appropriate goal for a theory of justice. Yet, he's led to take institutions as merely instrumentally valuable. He says, quote, whatever good, institutions may be whatever good may be associated with institutions, it's hard to think of them as being basically good in themselves, rather than possibly being effective ways of realizing acceptable or excellent social achievements, close quote. This position is familiar to students of consequentialism. And it suffers from the problems that consequentialism generally has. For example, it provides unstable moral support for institutions due to the ever-present rationale of correcting institutional outcomes in the name of maximal realization of good outcomes. Un it also provides unstable support for individual responsibility for the same sorts of reasons. And it supports the cultivation of non-consequentialist attitudes in, in the public to the extent that this serves 
maximal realization of good consequences or good, or good outcomes. Philosophers in the audience might call this government house realization focus. So in light of those problems and in light of a plausible account of uh, a plausible institutional account of global egalitarianism, I submit to you that, the, that institutionalism looks pretty good in comparison to a realization focus. Finally, think about the, the distinction between transcendentalism and the comparison approaches. I strongly endorse Professor Sen's urging that our accounts of justice should allow us to, quote, consider any of the great many changes that can be proposed for reforming the institutional structure of the world today to make it less unfair and less unjust. In that sense, I'm firmly in the comparison camp. But I, I wonder who isn't, actually. Who are the transcendentalists seeking a perfect justice which does not apply to the world with all its imperfections? Hobbes wasn't one of these people in his efforts to try to avert civil war, nor I think was Locke one of these people in his efforts to try to um, try to breed tolerance amongst warring Christian sects. I provided evidence that Rawls wasn't one of these people. Now consider a powerful 18th century rejection of perfection. Quote, I open the books on rights and on ethics. I listen to the professors and jurists, and my mind is full of their seductive doctrines. I admire the peace and justice established by the civil order. I bless the wisdom of, wisdom of our political institutions and knowing myself a citizen, cease to lament that I am a man. Thoroughly instructed as to my duties and my happiness, I close the book, step out of the lecture room, and look around me. I see wretched nations groaning beneath the yoke of iron. I see mankind ground down by a handful of oppressors. I see a famished mob worn down by suffering and famine, which the uh, while the rich drink the blood and the tears of their victims at their ease. I see on every side the strong armed with the terrible powers of the law against the weak. That's Jean-Jacques Rousseau. My concern then is that the argument against transcendentalism that Professor Sen offers is a critique of pure straw man transcendentalism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, political philosophy concerned with justice and much of the history of political philosophy, especially the contract tradition, committed to this um, transcendental conception of justice. And in opposition, he wants to pursue a conception of comparative justice that he associates, at least historically, with um, lessons learned both from uh, the consequentialist tradition in uh, moral and political philosophy figures such as um, John Stuart Mill, um, Jeremy Bentham, uh, but also social choice theory. And, and I want to look a little more closely at the contrast between transcendentalism and the comparative view. In fact, I find it somewhat elusive. I think part of my problem is that there are a bunch of different things that Sen associates with the views he wants to critique. So there are many different and I think really orthogonal dimensions along which he wants to critique uh, some contemporary views. So there's assumptions about perfect justice, there's assumptions about ideal theory, there's assumptions about institutions versus realizations, and there's also the contrast um, between parochial nationalism and global justice. And I do think that a lot of these contrasts are quite orthogonal. Um, so um, I agree with Daryl that there's no essential connection that I can see between institutionalism and statism. Um, also, if you think about the critique of statism and the defense of global justice, if anything, that should suggest that Amartya Sen would end up defending a more transcendent conception of justice, right? Because it transcends the parochial concerns of <coughs> statism and nationalism. Uh, the worry is that if there's so many different things that transcendentalism might stand for, that transcendentalism just becomes a simple pejorative with no independent descriptive content. And I'd like to avoid that, and I'd like to focus on what at least I took to be the central um, independent content. So I'm going to focus mostly on the claims about perfect justice and ideal theory. Um, but maybe start with an, uh, a warning that might be obvious to the philosophers in the audience, but that is that 
Uh, you might have thought that transcendental justice employs transcendental arguments, um, but it doesn't. Uh, transcendental arguments are particular kinds of philosophical arguments that are extremely ambitious. They am aim to show that establish a conclusion as a necessary condition for the possibility of something we take for granted. So Aristotle gave a transcendental argument for the principle of non-contradiction and Kant is supposed to have uh, tried to give a transcendental argument for the categories of space and time for sensory experience. And Rawls and others just aren't offering transcendental justice in that sense. They're not offering transcendental arguments, they're offering arguments of systematic comparative plausibility, or to use Rawls's uh, convenient phrase, uh, ar arguments of reflective equilibrium. Okay, well, so let's turn uh, to perfect justice. Um, that's one thing that transcendentalism is supposed to be committed to, and the alternative is supposed to um, focus on comparative justice between imperfectly just alternatives. Um, now, I gather a worry about perfect justice in this sense is that it's utopian. Um, and that it would have nothing to say about real world conditions of imperfect justice, and so can't help us navigate among accessible alternatives, none of which is perfectly just. This contrast might be related to the familiar contrast between ideal and non-ideal theory. I think there are different ways of understanding the contrast, but one way is that ideal theory states first best principles of justice that would get things right if everyone reasoned correctly, were motivated correctly, um, and so forth. Uh, by contrast, non-ideal theory consists in principles that would be appropriate for people with various cognitive and motivational limitations and who have trouble conforming to principles of justice. So in this sense, um, for instance, uh, Plato and Aristotle have famously claimed that uh, monarchy or aristocracy is the best ideal form of government, but that democracy is the best non-ideal form of government. And it might seem that um, Rawls is a transcendentalist in this sense um, uh, because he does defend justice as fairness as part of ideal theory and he asks contractors in the original position to choose principles for a well-ordered society in which each affirms and acts in accordance with the principles that would be chosen. But I think we should slow down here. Um, defending a conception of justice as an account of perfect justice or for ideal theory does not make it irrelevant to circumstances of partial justice or non-ideal theory. For instance, Rawls's two principles of justice may be principles that he thinks appropriate for ideal theory, but they also provide a yardstick for measuring how far we fall short um, of perfect justice and for determining respects in which we do fall short. Moreover, the principles may allow us to say in many cases that one imperfectly just arrangement is superior to another because more or less close to the ideal of perfect justice. This would allow us to make the comparative assessments. So consider, for instance, what Rawls says about the interpretation of the second principle of justice. You may remember that initially he characterizes it as the claim that social and economic goods are to be to everyone's advantage and that they are to be um, open under conditions of um, uh, a fair equality of opportunity. And he considers three different interpretations of this principle. The principle of natural liberty, which we might call the laissez-faire principle, the principle of liberal equality, and the principle of democratic equality, which is his preferred alternative. Now, the principle of liberal equality critiques the laissez-faire arrangement because it views the um, outcomes of the social lottery, what caste one is born into, uh, as morally arbitrary and it seeks to mitigate them. But that's an unstable resting point, Rawls thinks, and so democratic equality is supposed to correct for the effects of the natural lottery, which are supposed to be equally morally arbitrary. Um, now, um, so it's democratic equality that's the theory of perfect justice, if you like. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't prefer liberal equality to laissez-faire if for some reason de democratic equality is not feasible. I also think it's a little odd to invoke the utilitarian tradition against perfect justice. I mean, it's true that utilitarians are happy to promote utility somewhat, um, uh, even when they cannot maximize utility, but the basis of these local and imperfect reforms is the utilitarian standard of perfect rightness, that actions, policies, and institutions are right insofar as they promote utility. Um, 
Sen also claims that perfect justice is neither necessary nor sufficient for comparative justice. This was a point he emphasized last night, and he illustrates it with preference orderings. Perfect justice is insufficient for comparative justice or non-ideal justice because even though you and I might agree uh, both in, in ranking A above B and C, we might disagree about which is the second best feasible option. Similarly, he claims perfect justice is unnecessary for comparative justice or non-ideal justice because you and I might agree that B is the best feasible improvement over the status quo, even though we disagree about whether A or C is best. But again, I think we need to slow down a bit. He illustrates the non-necessity of perfect justice by saying that libertarians and egalitarians can agree that slavery is unjust and ought to be abolished. But all that shows, I would submit, is that diverse views can agree on a bet that part of perfect justice, whatever else will be true of it, will be a requirement of equal rights to self-ownership and personal liberty. With regard to the sufficiency claim, it is true that agreement on a first best option does not itself imply agreement on a second best option. But of course, perfect just justice doesn't just rank options, it involves a commitment to principles that explain why the first best option is the first best option. Um, but then it's not clear why perfectly just principles wouldn't allow us to rank options according to their approximation to the best. Um, let me then turn uh, briefly to the issue of uh, objectivity and pluralism. Part of transcendentalism, I think, is the promise of a uniquely correct set of principles of justice. And Sen is skeptical about whether there is a single principle or set of principles that would be acceptable to all rational contractors. With this, I'm actually quite sympathetic. For instance, there's Harsanyi's famous contractual argument for average utilitarianism, and Rawls's argument for why contractors in the original position would employ the maximum decision rule, even if it were successful against unrestricted average utilitarianism, would be inconclusive against so-called mixed conceptions, in which utilitarian reasoning is constrained by the prior principles, and a view we, that's sometimes called sufficientarianism, which allows risk-taking, but only once a certain threshold level of well-being has been reached. Um, so I think one might reasonably disagree with Rawls about whether the contractual argument delivers his unique set of principles. But that kind of indeterminacy doesn't preclude him from making comparative assessments. If the contract argument supported widely divergent principles of justice, such as the difference principle and laissez-faire, well, that might limit um, the comparative assessments we could make among options. But if instead the two principles um, uh, that is of um, um, uh, laissez-faire and sufficientarianism um, uh, agree in the condemnation of laissez-faire and their support of rights to education and health care and fair equality of opportunity of the sort provided by something like the Americans with Disabilities Act, then we get comparative assessments um, and we get um, agreement made despite um, indeterminacy about which first principle is correct. Uh, so uh, I'll end by noting that um, uh, a, a way in which this idea might be developed, and I'd be interested to hear what ha Sen has to say, um, and also I'd like to raise a question about whether he's really disagreeing with Rawls then. Um, sometimes he writes favorably, that is Sen, about the possibility of making comparative assessments and moral and political progress without settling on the sort of first principles that Rawls seems to be arguing for in a theory of justice. This might sound a lot like what Cass Sunstein has called the method of incompletely theorized agreements, which try to resolve potentially divisive policy disputes by appeal to low-level principles that are common ground to rival philosophical systems with their competing first principles. But I actually thought that this was a direction that Rawls himself had uh, taken in more recent writings, in particular in political liberalism, where he tries to argue that something like justice as fairness could be seen as the point of intersection of an overlapping consensus of different comprehensive um, moral and political doctrines. And Sunstein, for instance, certainly sees his own method of incompletely theorized agreements as indebted to Rawls on this front, and it sounds like the sort of thing that Sen's arguing for. So even if we agreed about doubts about indeterminacy, I'm not sure we need to see Sen and Rawls disagreeing fundamentally. These are all very rich engagements with Sen's book, and they deal with different parts of his argument. So I won't try to in any way bring them together, 
but I'll offer instead a comment or two on each paper that might help trigger the discussion. I'll comment on the papers, or as the presenters humbly call them, memos, in reverse order, beginning with Mollendorf. Mollendorf focuses on Sen's distinction between transcendental approaches and comparative approaches to addressing global justice. He argues that the contrast does not carry much weight and that many of the features of the comparative approach can also be found in the trans transcendental approach. One, in both approaches, we can gain guidance for making comparative assessments. Two, it is not the case that the only comparisons we can make within a transcendental approach are in terms of steps away from perfection. Three, incompleteness applies as much in transcendental approaches as in comparative ones. I'm not sure that these points address the core of Sen's concern about transcendental approaches. Mollendorf succeeds in showing us that what a comparative approach can do, a transcendental one can do as well. But the core of what Sen says about the transcendental approach is that a transcendental theory and a transcendental standard are neither necessary nor sufficient for meaningful comparison. For Sen, and I'm quoting him from yesterday's talk, this is a huge relief. Given how much intellectual energy is sunk into developing and refining transcendental theories and the never-ending controversies between different transcendental theories, <laughs> I would have to agree that it would be a huge relief if we can do without them. So it does not suffice for Mollendorf to show us that the transcendental approach is as good as the comparative one. To justify all the intellectual investment poured into transcendental theories of justice, we need to see something more than what comparative approaches can offer us. In order to convince me that the contrast, the contrast between transcendental and comparative approaches does not carry much weight, Mollendorf would need to engage Sen's claim that a transcendental theory of justice is neither necessary nor sufficient. Until then, the contrast strikes me as very useful. It at least alerts us not to get overly exercised over conflicting transcendental theories. A second point on Mollendorf's engagement with Sen has to do with institutionalism. Sen argues that transcendental approaches to global justice tend to look towards perfect global institutions that amount to something like a global state or something like world government. Mollendorf points out that transcendental institutionalist approaches to global justice need not do that. They are not necessarily statist, he tells us. Here, I think that both Sen and Mollendorf could both be more careful in expressing what they mean. The words statist, world state, world government are not here very useful. The question seems to be whether an institutionalist approach to global justice necessarily entails a vision of global and intersocietal institutions that can legitimately enforce global norms. What we call this, whether we call it global state, world government, or simply global political order, doesn't matter much. The proposals for reforming the global economic order that Mollendorf offers in the memo but that he doesn't discuss, uh, didn't discuss today um, it, it include matters of education policy, immigration policy, standardization of working conditions, and international financial transaction tax. Now, if these proposals are to amount to anything, they would require global enforcement institutions that resemble those of a global political order. Whether we call that a world state or not is neither here nor there. So it seems to me that Mollendorf has here illustrated that Sen is right. He, Mollendorf, has not succeeded here in offering us a vision of an institutional global order that is not statist. Uh, now I'm going to say something brief also about Professor Leiden's paper. Leiden argues that Rawls and Sen are more similar in their approaches than might, at than, than might at first appear. Both are working within a frame of ideal theory. Here, ideal theory, here, ideal theory means that ideals function as constraints on how we relate to one another rather than as goals we pursue. According to Leiden, as I understand him, the point of ideal theory in Rawls is to describe the psychology of the reasonable democratic citizen. It shows us how we can each be the change. In order to see this in Rawls more clearly, Leiden says we should interpret fairness in Rawls as reciprocity rather than as impartiality. When we do so, we focus on the role of the actors themselves rather than on the role of an umpire that he says is evoked by the idea of impartiality. My question to Professor Leiden is the following. 
Sen highlights the distinction between closed impartiality that he argues is captured by Rawls in the device of the original position, and open impartiality that he argues is, captures, is captured by Adam Smith's device of the impartial spectator. If Leiden is right, and Rawls and Sen are very much alike in trying to get at how we are to relate to one another, we can still ask whether one of the two devices better captures the constraints we are to adopt when we relate to or address one another. Does the distinction that Sen makes between these two devices and the image of closed versus open hold once we interpret fairness as reciprocity rather than as impartiality? Or do you think that this distinction no longer has any meaning or hold? I'm going to skip some of the other comments and I'm going to move quickly to Professor Arneson's paper. Professor Arneson argues that the capability approach is best defended when capabilities refer to actual functionings and to well-being. He accepts Sen's critique of Rawls as primary goods. Like Sen, he thinks that we need to focus on what really matters, people's lives. With Sen, he says that capabilities better capture the intuition underlying our desire for just distributions than do primary goods. Arneson argues that when we focus on primary goods, we risk fetishizing the means at the expense of neglecting how they affect people's lives. He parts ways with Sen in arguing that since capabilities too are means, we risk fetishizing another means when we focus on capabilities. Arneson would like us to focus on well-being because it is, after all, what makes meaning, what gives meaning to primary goods, goods and what gives meaning to capabilities. But I understand Rawls and Sen to not focus on well-being for a reason, because to do so would be to go down the slippery slope of paternalism. It seems to me that what is so attractive about the capability approach, as Sen presents it, is precisely that it avoids the danger that Rawls was also trying to avoid when he focused on primary goods but that it corrects for one of the weaknesses of a focus so distant from people's lives. Sen brings us closer to considering people's lives than does Rawls, but not so close as to risk obscuring the distinctions between persons and neglecting the pluralism of their goals and aspirations. There seems to be wisdom in this distance. Thanks. So in an ideal world, we'd let them chat with one another, but the best alternative for us in, with finite time is to move to first uh, Amartya Sen uh, may respond uh, as he pleases and this is on TV so everything goes into the microphone and then um, I'll um, call on um, uh, participants and the audience uh, somewhat back and forth so that uh, everyone has a, a well, at least some chance to participate. And Anthony Lyon, our recent PhD from political science and UCSD, will be managing the microphone. And he will he'll hold it in your face, if you don't mind. <laughs> and that way he can take it away when I signal it. <laughs> Is that a comfortable position for you? Or? Yes, yes, very comfortable. Okay, good, thank you. Well, um, I, I really thought that I got delayed and I didn't, um, I, by the time I arrived, Arneson's presentation has already been made. And uh, I actually, reading the paper, I didn't think that we really disagreed um, so much on, on issues. I think the one issue was the well-being issue. And there, like all his other comments, uh, Fareed seemed to have responded exactly what I would have liked to have said, excepting he said it's much better. Uh, and so I, 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 that's where I would say that I think, uh, you, you don't sort of dismiss uh, the, uh, the, the possibility that there are non-well-being goals of others which are concerned, but you take a somewhat rule utilitarian position that ultimately they promote well-being. Uh, and in that sense, that, and you could claim that it's not shown, even the example that you quote, uh, I don't know, in the presentation, but in the paper, that I discussed about pulling down the shade in it, is, it could be explained in the utilitarian term. That's the case, in fact, it's possible that it could be. But it, like so many utilitarian claims, there's a lot of hand-waving in that, that it may work out that, where there's a direct appeal that somebody wants to do something, and in terms of rules of behavior in that society, relates a little to Tony Layton's point about the importance of constraint, that you don't do it and uh, you don't, you let him be, let him play the silly game that he wants to play without taking a view that it would be his well-being and without being convinced by the rule 
well-being reason that ultimately this could be justified as a good rule to promote well-being. So that, my, that would be at one point of difference. The, the, uh, it's not a foundational difference, I think, but um, uh, I think ultimately the way the theory is constructed, it would, could make a difference. The other is the, uh, the, the only point where I thought that there were real sharp difference was that you seem to think that, um, that the, uh, where exactly is it, uh, somewhere in your paper in the beginning, it's, you seem to think that by not wanting a complete ordering and going, not wanting a complete theory, uh, my claim rather is that a complete theory could be, uh, could make room for a partial ordering. Indeed, most complete theories do. And I think that's the point that I was trying to explain to make. And I would like to say, and, you know, I am a theorist, and I think it would come up more in later discussion, uh, like Kukatas' paper, about whether uh, we need that kind of theory or not. But uh, uh, I think we do need theory. That's the position that I look forward to discussing later on. But um, it's a characterization of what, what form a complete theory it would take. That's really I'm concerned with. Um, Again, with Tony Layden, I don't have um, uh, really very strong disagreement. And I think the, it, it, the part of the point really is that I was telling Tony about breakfast is something I was quoting Bob Nozick, that when we were teaching a course together, he said the real difficulty is that there's very little way of placing yourself in where you stand without explaining why you differ and where you differ from Rawls. Because he kind of established coordinate, and you say you go three inches to the right, and then half an inch up, and that's where I am. Now that immediately makes it look that your entire concentration is differentiation with Rawls. It's not so much the case. It's just he is the coordinate in terms of which you have to think. So you know the book is dedicated to Rawls. The book would not have been written but for Rawls. It did every critical argument I presented there. I have discussed, who occupied happily for me, I was in between Hilary Putnam and Jack Rawls, so I had good conversation. Uh, and uh, every one of them I argued with him, I had lunch with him on that, and whatever form it came, generated by that. You, you know that, you, in, you were there at that time. So I, I, the, on the subject of the constraints and the, and the goals, the fact that there is, there is a connection, and if you put, go back to your mathematical incarnation, when I first found you, when you were a mad student, um, of course, since Lagrange, we have known that there is a clear connection. There's no question. What is the difference between Lagrange and, 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 and a constraintism, as things stand? I, I think a lot of the way of thinking about true constraint is a more constructive way than, than thinking in terms of goals, because the way our mind operates, it, 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 it appeals to us much more. But I think the one difference where the goals have an advantage is this, is that in case of consent, you either violate them or you don't. And there's a huge lot of problem about that you may have to violate some, which one do you violate? That kind of question comes up. Now in case of Lagrange, since all his constraints are derived from the goal, so that basically you get this Lagrangian multiplier, that if you violate the constraint, the penalty is that much. Now, the people who think in terms of constraint, and particularly deontologically, absolutely revel at the idea. You're attaching value to unit violation of this or that. And I think that's where the difficulty is, that in a world in which you are dealing with alternatives, none of which you accept as perfect, that that dialogue is very difficult to avoid. So if there's any advantage in the gold side, it's for that Lagrangian reason, I think. The, uh, but I, otherwise, you know, it's music to my ears to be told that it's, uh, I'm not disagreeing with Rawls <laughs> as much, but that's the way I have to say why I am, which is exactly what Bob Nozick did too, though he actually did disagree with Rawls uh, in a more robust and original way than I do. Um, on Daryl's comments, um, somewhat um, um, puzzled me. Um, uh, I think part of the thing is that they, I didn't think the law of people was a theory of justice. Uh, you know, I think, and I never said the law of people was constrained by uh, 
wanting sovereign state. I think the story, as I understand it, that he did the theory of justice, uh, which is a story of what can be done within a sovereign state, and people like Tom Nagel had made that point absolutely clear why you cannot have a notion of global justice based on that. And there isn't a global state. But uh, Jack Rawls is uh, very concerned, as is Tom Nagel, uh, about what happens to the wretched world uh, in which we live. And that being so, and, and I don't think either of them would have been at all surprised by the, uh, by the nastiness of the world that you describe. Nor, might I say, I am surprised to hear about how unequal things are between wealth and income, though I personally would have liked to have seen great, you know, more emphasis on inequalities of healthcare, education, uh, treating uh, people with respect, and, and than, than just income uh, differentiation. I, I think what happens is that in the, in the law of the state, he's trying to say, how far can you go without a theory of justice proper? He doesn't actually present a theory of justice. He uses the word, unlike Tom Nagel, who doesn't want to use the word global justice at all, Rawls slipped into it often. These were the first lecture that he gave, which was an amnesty lecture in Oxford. He did that quite a bit. It was quite clearly pained him. But where I thought that uh, the, I think my critique, if you thought that I was saying any limitation of law of the people arises from, the, uh, because the, uh, the assumption of sovereign state is false, there is no assumption of a sovereign global state by law. That's never my criticism. But why is it that he's writing the law of people? It's because there isn't a global sovereign state. What can we do? That's the way I understand what to be. And there had to be, and I think it's the direction of Tony Layden, more Rawlsian than you are. Uh, I think this halfway uh, house that you you were surprised by, uh, you know, uh, Rawls taught us the, the importance of uh, recognizing that people do have moral powers. But he didn't teach us that our moral powers are such that we don't need a kind of theory of justice based on a much more uh, conceptual analysis. So I think the halfway house is what is reading of moral powers where that people would not be moved in San Diego about the fact that there's some inequality between San Diego and, 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 and let's say Cairo, but they will be moved by lack of certain things, like basic freedom to express your views and so on. And that is the nature of the diagnosis of moral powers that Rawls gave us, and I happen to very firmly agree with him. So I, in my judgment, the law of people is a brilliant book. It's not a book on the theory of justice. So I think that's quite a fundamental difference between us, perhaps. Um, on the subject of institutions, institutions are very important uh, in, in, in my analysis, and has been throughout. I mean, even I think what um, Fauna wrongly attributed my novel to my famine analysis, where the first citation begins with saying, uh, the paper uh, that calls it to say necessary and sufficient conditions of binary consistency of majority decision was not about famine. And indeed, uh, it wasn't almost nothing to do with it. As an afterthought, they said he had done some work on famine. <laughs> but uh, all this work on things like famine, which are uh, whether or not it, it generated me to, uh, to get any money from the Swedes, uh, it was. It was certainly a uh, very institutional theory. It's all, all my work has been institutional theory. I think the issue isn't that. I think there are two issues. I think Farid got that exactly right. I think one is how do we judge things? Uh, namely, uh, you know, how are people's lives going? And, you know, Rawls is ultimately interested. That's how he motivates it. But once you've got the principle of justice, this is the one hit clause. It's not what in the old-fashioned days we used to call parametric programming. You have valuation to get the results, and looking at the results, then you say, did we get the way it's right? And look back again and do back and forth in that. So there is no parametric programming in, in Rawls at all. So there is a kind of, you get this one-shot institution, and then you accept, because it came from uh, principles of justice. Now, I think the difficulty with, with I mean, the, uh, taking a institution-related view is one partly that, what if your first guess is wrong? I mean, if you take Dworkin, for example, like most non-economists writing in philosophy, he has a tremendous faith in economics. 
and therefore assumes that the market and economy can deliver things, which we know for sequence of 30 years of analysis that in a situation of asymmetric information, which in short and market always will be, it will never be able to deliver anything that Dworkin imagined uh, it, it might. But there is no thought to say, okay, if after all these conch-shell markets, if you end up that people have terribly unequal health care related to their disability or, 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 or uh, genetic propensity, there is no way of revising it because uh, uh, nothing else. That's it. You got it. And that's one shot without. I think if you're not taking institutions as anything, uh, you know, as something very important, affects our life. Yesterday I gave some example as to why being starved to death is not the same thing as dying of hunger because of being, uh, being poor. Um, institutions are made important, but they cannot be put in a position that it, no matter what the outcomes come out, that you do not revise your institutional thinking. So it's that feature that's very important in my judgment. And, you know, uh, I, I, I think um, uh, I wouldn't have spent as much time doing it, but for the fact that Rawls took us in that direction, and that made me think about it. So some of my debt to, uh, to Rawls is, is immediate and constructive. Others are dialectical. This is one of the dialectical ones. Why don't I think that Rawls got that right? And I've had at least um, 10 conversations with Jack on that. So, I, and I don't think he would have totally disagreed either. I, too, I think Tony quotes a bit of that, that I, it, in, the, in, the, in, in some of his later writing, he's quite aware of some of the points I, I'm, I'm trying to make. And he makes them, and in fact, uh, I don't think he quite resolves them. I think at that stage in his life, he wasn't going to change his theory of justice in any way. So, uh, I think that's one issue about the institutional thing. And the other thing is that um, is is what it leaves out. That is this, uh, and uh, and that ac actually was Tony's uh, senior thesis, namely that it assumes a behavior pattern. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. That uh, when you, that is, uh, he was criticizing quite rightly. Who who were you criticizing? Game theorists. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Some game theorists who say the Rawls thing is not a Nash equilibrium or something like that. Some really rather silly remark on that. And he pointed out that he doesn't seem to take account of the fact that once you are in the original position, you have contracted to do something. And the game that you're playing is a different behavioral game. And that will, that affects your behavior. Now, what if the behavior doesn't conform to that? That question that is that behavior might have a real dimension. Now to say that this is, I'm assuming, compliant, and it would be always interesting to know what would happen with compliance, and Ralph gives that. But you would need to have a theory, also what happens if it isn't, and if it's not, it doesn't have that transcendental feature, and, and uh, I think for his first comment was, that that distinction remains, very, to me, very significant. And that's not a disrespect to institution and the profound importance in society as well as our individual life and in our relation with each other. Now, I, on, on, uh, on David um, Brink's point, I think the... Um, I think this transcendental is... Uh, I, I don't know that I should have used the word. Um, I, my difficulty was that I couldn't say superlative because the right, wrong people don't like superlative at all. Uh, and the, the, um, um, the uh, I recognize transcendental has many, many different meanings. It never occurred to me that anyone would think that transcendental arguments uh, are something that I'm talking about. <laughs> I think even you don't, but you do talk about it uh, as something I don't talk about. Um, but. Um, uh, I, I think this is very ambiguous. Uh, I think, I guess, uh, Tom, Tom Lingle and I were doing joint seminar in Colombia when he reacted so, he got so animated when I said transcendental. I thought that since animation is something which I've always um, appreciated, I thought that I ought to use it because that seemed to be a way of getting some bump out of people. Uh, 
Otherwise, you know, the real danger is to say, well, okay, fine, I accept it, and, and you know, let's to go on, and there's a nice dinner somewhere. So, uh, but maybe you're mistaken, in, maybe you're right to think that I'm mistaken to have used the word. But, you know, I define it pretty well, what, you know, pretty clearly, what is it that I'm trying to say. And it's not a utopian type consequentialist theory. I won't go into it, but I did discuss it yesterday as to why I don't think you're getting any, any comparison with utilitarianism helped at all. I mean, that's to take you from frying pan to fire, in, in my judgment. The, um, the question about this, um, um, the, the real difficulty is that transcendental way of doing comparative is fixed on the idea that somehow from distance, the closeness, you will get something. That, I think, is a mathematical folly. Because if you have multiple dimensions of violation, it could be liberty is not being properly done, it could be, there are lots of things that, uh, you know, that the economic inequalities are greater or less, uh, and then the first principle, uh, a second principle, first part, namely that office is being open to everyone, is not being violated. When you have the multiple di dimension, there isn't no any natural concept of a scalar distance between them. And there the mathematics is quite important. That's the point you're departing a three, three, four, five, six di dimension. You can't get any kind of ordering of comparative based on that identification and try to get as close. Nor can you, and you did at one stage say that we have to ask what would be a part of a just world. That's one way of understanding when they're debating. But that may not be. I'm a supporter of... Um, Philip Van Fari and the basic income hypothesis, uh, on grounds that as the world stands today, it would make a big difference to have the basic income given. Would it be a part of an ideal world? No, I don't think so. And it's the same kind of contrast that, um, that, uh, that Marx is drawing in, in, in the critique of Gotha program, that there's something that you could support now, like payment according to work, uh, though it's a bourgeois right, and ultimately, in the, in, in the ideal world, it will have no place in that. So to say that the ideal world allows us to tell between different practices today on grounds of what would be a part of the ideal world, I believe um, is, 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 is um, David a folly. And that's what I would think. Uh, I, think the, uh, I think that would probably that pretty much I'm very grateful. Thank you. <laughs> OK, thanks very much. Uh, uh, somebody from one of the participants. Yes, Richard Miller. OK. Uh, this is uh, directed uh, at Dick Arneson, but perhaps at Amartya Sen as well, because it's a question about the uh, Sen Arneson knockout blow uh, uh, directed at uh, Okay, then, uh, well, you can help each other out, maybe. Uh, directed at Rawls's emphasis on primary social goods. Uh, it seems to me that it's, uh, uh, at least as offered by Dick, uh, it sounds to me like an uh, excessively apolitical criticism directed at a political pro uh, project. Uh, uh, at least in the mature roles, the original position is just a device for representing how politically reasonable uh, people uh, would deliberate with uh, one another. Uh, it does seem to me that it's part of political reasonableness to avoid imposing uh, a basic structure on other politically reasonable people committed to the vague general liberal political values that we're trying to uh, interpret a basic structure on the basis of uh, an argument with premises they can't in good conscience accept. And doesn't seem to me to take the edge off this if those basic convictions are ones that if they were fully rational and fully informed, uh, they would abandon, I might be the sort of atheist who thinks people, religious people would abandon their theism if they were fully rational, fully informed. That still doesn't justify me in using atheistic premises in this uh, imposing the basic structure uh, uh, on them. Look, if you think that and you want to devise standards of justice that we politically reasonable people should apply in finding the right basic structure, it seems to me Rawls's particular social primary goods used where he uses them 
are the best implementation of that conviction. And you might say it's just political implementation. That's all that Rawls is interested in, in his attempt to reconcile with Amartya Sen in political liberalism. I take that to be what he's saying. Maybe capabilities are what we ultimately care about. Political implementation is what I care about. It's there that to respect one another, we have to rely on my social primary good. So uh, uh, why, uh, uh, why is, is Rawls knocked out, if that's the right understanding? Um, one minute. It would be, nice be nice to have interchanges, but we have two to four break time where people can carry on conversation. Terrific question. Just very quickly. I accept the liberal legitimacy norm. You shouldn't impose on people uh, except by appeal to principles that qua reasonable and rational they can accept. But everything hinges on this notion of reasonable. If you ratchet it way down, so Arneson, uninformed, you know, is, and, and superstitious, can still count as reasonable, then it's a very demanding constraint. It rules out practically anything. If you ratchet up, then you can say, look, we're imposing on people in the name of principles that are correct, or the most plausible we can give, given, given our circumstances, even though you, know, you, don't, you don't actually accept them. That's, I don't think that's disrespectful to people. Uh, so so, so, I mean, so that, that, that's, that's the quick answer. Just, just one, one tiny thing on agency and, agency and well-being. You know, why should we be focused on well-being as the ultimate? I mean, look, shouldn't we be giving people freedom, for instance, to be, you know, think of Mother Teresa. People pursue non-well-being oriented goals, impersonal goals. They pursue the good of others, not themselves. So what is this with, with just, just we, we just, you know, help people get well-being. But the answer to that is first, look, you know, well-being is not just, you know, having, you know, your brain stimulated and getting pleasure. It's agency. It's doing good and valuable things. So that's what we're going to be trying to, to focus on people. Suppose, what about altruistic agency? Suppose Mother Teresa says, I want to aid the poor in Calcutta, or I want to save the whales, and therefore you should be giving me resources. There's two, there's two thoughts here. One is, uh, I, the, first, well, I take this as we should be helping her, if she's right, for the sake of the whales and their well-being, or for the sake of the poor in Calcutta and their well-being, not for her well-being. Uh, and th that might involve just ignoring her altogether, just, just going to Oxfam or something. Suppose, but suppose she says, well, no, 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 I meant I wanted to save the whales or save the poor in Calcutta by my agency. Well, then we've got a mixed case. Then it's partly well-being. And I, I don't dismiss you know, people's agency goals, meaning I want to help my children by my agency. That's a mixed goal, partly for the well-being of others, partly for myself. You know, you know I don't want it, you know. So, so I mean, I, that, roughly, that's, that's the way I would go in response to that. Thanks for that. So, sorry, sorry, that was, I was moving away from Richard responding to Professor Sam. I, I forgive you. So, <laughs> somebody in the audience. <laughs> this is your chance. You can ask anything. Okay. Eva? Sure. Sure. <laughs> One minute. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, this is a question for Anthony Layden. Um, would you be able to, to reinterpret, uh, this is a question about clarification, sort of, would you be able to reinterpret Rawls's um, argumentation from reflective equilibrium, the concept of, of how people come to accept or come to justify you know, their acceptance of the original position. In terms of um, your distinction between justice as relating to others uh, versus justice as uh, social engineering based on goals or blueprints. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, a good question. Um, I guess the, the, the short answer is one way to think about why reflective equilibrium is an appropriate justificatory standard in philosophy is because what we're doing in political philosophy, at least if we're doing it the way I think Rawls is doing it, is we're trying to figure out how to talk to each other and, and be responsive to one another, right? So if I'm trying to figure out what kinds of arguments can I make to you that you will find reasonable and appealing and we can find common ground on, then the mark of the goodness of my arguments is going to 
be based on whether, you know, when I hear what you say back to me and when I hear what other people say back to me, um, and this in some sense goes to Farid's point about open and closed impartiality, reciprocity becomes a sort of implicitly open ideal um, that what I'm looking for is reflective equilibrium, right? So reflective equilibrium is both in my own head thinking about what grounds my view, but since what has to ground my view is something that I can present to you openly in good faith, it had better be something that you know, we can find common ground on, and that's why reflective equilibrium is the right way to think about what grounds our, our theoretical commitments. Um, for the non-political theorist, all reflective equilibrium means is coming up with a few simple principles that most coherently account for the variety of our intuitions about political and, and moral arrangements. Uh, somebody in here. Oh, Anthony. <laughs> uh, very quick version of uh, two versions of the same question to uh, Tony and to Farid. Uh, Tony, could you say something very quickly, perhaps explaining why the difference between constraints and goals is not doesn't line up with the deontological consequentialist um, distinction? And then Farid, maybe this isn't exactly the same thing. You posed to Tony the question of whether the original position or the Rawlsian mechanism generally is better than the uh, Smithian impartial spectator. I wonder what your own view is on that, if you're willing to say. Um, my mind just went completely blank on what the question was. Thank you. Uh, so one way to think about it is, I mean, I think Sen's view isn't consequentialist in the sense that he doesn't just look at, you know, at time t, what does the world look like? but there's all this other stuff that goes into, you know, time t got there because of time t minus one and t minus two. So the difference between a person being dead and a person being murdered is not, in some sense, the consequence of their being dead. It's the consequence of their, the person's agency involved in killing them. And so I think you can capture all that richness, you know, what he would call informational richness that's really important in thinking about justice and still think that justice is an engineering problem, right? Justice is creating a world that has these features and these possibilities for agency and, you know, and maybe even there's this issue about, well, we got there this way and that it would have been better if we got there that way. Um, but it's still, you know, justice is this thing in the future that we're trying to find the path to. Um, whereas on the, the kind of view I was trying to give, justice is sort of here and now how we behave and how we assess what we're doing now in, in our talking to each other. I'm a discussant. I wasn't expecting to get questions, but uh, the, I, I think that the openness of Smith's view, as, as Sen describes it, is very compelling. But I, I also share with Leiden the, the worry that it evokes the image of an umpire. So there is the participant aspect of the original position is more compelling, but there is this sense of it being closed. Hannah Arendt and Sheila bin Habib using Hannah Arendt sort of evokes something that allows us to use the openness of Smith while, you know, within a participatory uh, frame. That perhaps is where I end up. Yeah. I am now going to release you to 27 minutes of coffee break. And I will, uh, we're going to try to keep the conference on schedule. And so please enjoy. And I will be definitely calling you, Fana will be calling you back for the 1115.